next we're gonna we're gonna stay below ground and talk about managing wireworms and root crops with Scott Loons of UVM Extension and the Northwest Crops and Soils Program. Take it away, Scott. Awesome. Thank you, Vern, and thank you, everybody. Um, I, you know, today would have been a perfect day to drive to Fairly. Um, no ice storm or anything. So. Um, yeah, it, as I was driving to Burlington, the opposite direction, I um, was thinking about how, um, yeah, I would have much rather been seeing you all in person, um, and we'd, we'd be just about ready to have lunch. So I'm going to try to go relatively quickly. Vern, I don't know if you put me right before lunch because um, because you knew everybody would be hungry or, or not. But um, yeah, I just wanted to, to take this opportunity to share some of the work that Vic, Izzo, and I have been doing. Um, here in Vermont, we have a Northeast SARE research and education grant looking at a variety of different tactics for managing um, uh, wireworm in root crops. And so I'm going to share some of the research. Uh, we're about halfway through this project, so, so there's more, more to come for sure. Um, all right, so hopefully you're seeing this beautiful slide Vic put together. Actually, I should say Vic put this presentation entirely together, but then he had to teach um, at this time, and so I'm standing in for him. So um, wireworms, if you, if you didn't know, um, they're the larval form of a click beetle. So on the left-hand side, um, you see a click beetle. Um, they get their name because um, if you hold them in your hand, um, they will actually click. They've got a little, little part of their exoskeleton that, that kind of connects with another piece, and it's a defense mechanism um, to get away from predators. And so um, the adults, they're not the pests that we're worried about. It's their larvae. So those adults lay eggs at the base of, um, of plants, and then the, the eggs hatch, and you get that little um, really heavily armored um, wireworm beetle larva um, that feeds on, on um, roots uh, and root crops. Um, let me see here. Yeah, so just really quickly, the life cycle, if you didn't know, um, again, those eggs are laid um, right at the, the base of the, the, um, the plant and the, the, the wireworms, when they hatch, go down into the root zone. Um, those larvae will feed, depending upon a variety of factors, up to, up to six years uh, in the soil. Um, the, the different, we actually have a whole species complex here in the Northeast. It's not just one species of wireworm that, um, that is problematic. And so we don't know exactly what species are feeding at any one particular time. And it, in all likelihood, it's a, it's a bunch of different species. And so you, the, the result is it's really tricky to predict how long um, you're gonna have those wireworms feeding in the soil. Um, they, they feed on a whole host of uh, different crops, um, as well as, as non-crop plants. Um, cover crops, um, and so the damage can be can be almost non-existent to very troublesome, depending upon uh, what type of plant um, you're growing. And so the the damage, what we call the feeding galleries, um, are think about like if you threw a a potato up in the air and then shot it with a BB gun, right? Oftentimes you have these little holes that sometimes go straight into the the tuber. Um, sometimes if, if, it, if that BB just sort of grazed the side of it, it would go in and then, and then out. But generally those galleries are, are fairly deep holes um, and they're not just superficial. And so you, you can often with just a little bit of damage have a, have a non-marketable crop. Um, and again, if that crop is a root crop that you're trying to sell, um, it, it's gonna be very undesirable. Um, and so we're working with, with a, a, not entirely, but primarily folks who are managing uh, wireworms organically. Um, and the cover crops, um, particularly grass cover crops that immediately precede uh, vegetable crops can sometimes actually make the problem worse. Also going from sod into, into root crop can also make the, the problem worse. And so again, we're trying to come up with some, some various strategies that, that are compatible with, um, with the management that, that folks here in the Northeast are, are already doing. So um, 
the, the three main components of the research part of this project, um, one, looking at um, high glucosinolate mustards. Uh, a lot of work has been done on, on HGM, high glucosinolate mustards, um, for disease management in root crops. Um, there's been some work uh, with insect pests. I was actually talking with a, a friend of mine, John, from Bear Roots Farm a few years ago, and he, he asked me the question, um, well, what about using HGM to, to biofumigate the soil for, for insect pests? And so that, that's a great idea. John filed that away. And then when we, when we uh, got to write this grant, we included um, John on that. Um, another conversation that Vic and I recently had with, with Andy Jones, uh, he was telling us about, he thought maybe he noticed a difference depending upon that, that grass-based cover crop that he was using. Um, you know, sometimes depending upon the, the, the management needs, you might put an oak cover crop in earlier in the season or maybe later in the season, a, a rye cover crop. And so, um, great question, Andy, let's incorporate that uh, into this project. And so, so Vic and I, uh, and, and a lot of the folks that we work with, um, um, focus on participatory research, so incorporating farmers into the entire research process from developing the, the research questions to testing them, uh, to interpreting the results, um, and then, and then um, the next round, right? And so I just wanna highlight the, the process that, that we, we go through uh, in doing our research. The, the third component is, a, is a looking at various biopesticides uh, and their effectiveness. Um, against wireworms. Um, so we're looking at some, some products that are on the shelf now. So uh, one based on uh, entomopathogenic fungus, um, Bavaria, Bassiana. So Bottega is the, is the, um, is the label. Um, so there, there's another fungus that actually we think because of the temperatures, a lot of folks are growing sweet potatoes and black plastic. Um, and metarhizium is a, is a different fungus um, that actually does better at a warmer temperature. Um, there used to be a product uh, on the market, but actually after we got the grant and before we started the research, that product has been taken off the market. We've been working with a grad student here at UVM uh, to try to redevelop a, um, a commercialized version of metarhizium um, for, for for use uh, on organic farms, so so that one is is a uh, is like a homemade, if you will, um, metarhizium cocktail. Um, Bercolia is another product um, called Magistine that that we're working with, an insect bait. Uh, it's a spinosad bait. Um, the label is uh, Seduce, um, and then we've also worked with some entom entomopathogenic nematodes those that you can buy um, like from Arbico, the sort of biopesticide version. Uh, we've also worked with Elson Shields um, on the, the native um, nematodes from this, from, well, in New York at least. Um, and I know there's been a lot of success in some parts of New York um, introducing those native nematodes and getting fairly good um, uh, control of, of wireworms and root crops. Um, let me see here. Just wanna share some of our preliminary research. Um, with you all. So this is one of our sites up along the Canadian border. Um, on the bottom, you can see the layout. That's just a little map. We had a couple of different trials all in one area. So we had the, the HGM grown on one side of the field. Um, we had our biopesticide trial in the middle of the field. Uh, and then the, and that was cover crop with oat. And then we had the rye cover crop on the other end of the field. Um, what we did with the HGM is we were able to get in there at the end of March, um, drill that HGM this past spring. We had 60 days of really good growth. Uh, we terminated it, uh, flail mowed it, and immediately incorporated it, um, and then laid the plastic that day. Um, and so we were able to get a nice crop of HGM and then, and then essentially biofumigate in the, in the soil underneath the, the plastic mulch. Unfortunately, um, we didn't have very, well, fortunately, if you're growing sweet potatoes for market, unfortunately, if you're going for research, we had really low pressure. So you can see on the left-hand side, um, the average incidence, so the percent damage, our highest level was, was under 10%, right? So we grew amazing sweet potatoes, um, but with very little damage. Um, even with that tiny bit of damage, we did see some variability, not statist statistically significant. Um, 
Again, same thing with our with our cover crops, um, just not a lot of damage at all. Our oat, I think we were just over, I think we were 11%. Um, there was nothing in the rye uh, and the HGM was pretty small. Again, not statistically significant. We also conducted the same, very similar trial at the Hort Farm in South Burlington. Um, and, and even worse, uh, if for research, there were no wireworms at all, not a single um, tuber had a single wireworm gallery. Again, we grew, we grew great sweet potatoes, great for, um, for, for the sweet potato crop, not good for the research. But um, we took those lemons and made lemonade because there was a fair amount of um, oriental beetle damage. So those white grubs you see on the right-hand side, those C-shaped grubs, real fleshy, not at all like the, um, the wireworms. So we, we did have quite a bit of um, oriental beetle grub damage. So on the left-hand side, you can see those galleries are very different, very superficial um, and um, easily distinguishable, still causing blemishes um, on those sweet potatoes. Uh, so we figured, let's, let's take a look at those data. And so we had our, our trials. Um, again, same thing as I just described to you um, from Borderview. The only difference was um, our HGM crop didn't, uh, it failed. It was just way too dry um, the end of March in Burlington on that really sandy soil. And so what we did is um, we, we used uh, HGM meal. So we took seed, HGMC grounded up a thousand pound per acre um, was the rate, and then we we uh, yeah we incorporated that into um, the soil along with uh, our other amendments just prior to, to laying the plastic. Um, again, different pest entirely. Um, Brigade was our our conventional control. Um, which probably was was quite a bit less damage, although because of the variability, um, you know, the, the, it was not significant, but um, likely there's an effect on um, those oriental beetles. Um, same thing with the cover crop. Um, we saw quite a bit more rye cover crop, uh, sorry, beetle damage in the rye cover crop. Um, there was just a lot more residue um, from the rye than there was from the oat. Uh, we think that likely uh, harbored a lot of those oriental beetle grubs. Um, this same, well, the biopesticide trial um, was also done down at UMass. Our colleagues on uh, the vegetable program, we, we essentially did the same project um, that they did down in Amherst. Um, they also had fairly low damage, but they actually did have statistical difference between the seduce, so those spinosad baits um, that you incorporate into the soil was less than the untreated control. Um, again, this was wireworms, the target pest that we were hoping to see um, at, in our trial in Burlington. With that, I think my time is up and I will just ask if there are any last minute questions um, before y'all um, vote and then eat some lunch. Great uh, job, Scott. Yeah, we've got some flexibility of the time here because the vote won't take long. And there's a question about um, whether, if you have any sense of weather patterns influencing wireworm numbers, that this was a really bad year on this farm. I, to be honest, I don't know the answer for sure. My guess is they, because they spend so much time in the soil um, that the above ground weather is not going to impact them uh, very much. Um, and they're just going to um, spend their you know, life, whether it's three years or four years, just feeding on, on roots. Um, when they get nice and, and mature, then they're gonna head up. Um, and again, it's not necessarily the weather uh, that's impacting them. And there's a comment from Stephen Chamberlain down Dutch's farm saying he did a spring sown cover crop of oats and field peas ahead of fall carrots, waited a month before seeding the carrots, had 5% less wireworm damage. I'm not sure compared to what must be without the, without the cover crop. Wondering what your thoughts are about that, if it could be a good practice. I, yeah, I don't know. You might have gotten lucky, Stephen, um, 5% is a fairly low difference. And so it might've just been the sort of year to year um, variability. The other thing is, um, you know, what, what was in there three years ago, two years ago, one year might have more of an influence um, than, than what you did that spring since they have such a long um, period of time they spend in the soil. That's really interesting. The life cycle issue you pointed out because the, you know, conventional wisdom always is don't, 
don't plant after a sod, but it's really a long-term sod, right? That's the problem. I mean, having a, a grassy cover, anything attracted to that cover isn't going to do the damage that year. There's a lag time, right? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of years that it could potentially impact, for sure. So I was just curious. I know you can't do it on a commercial farm, but uh, is it possible to inoculate with wireworms to make sure you get... Uh, Make sure you get enough pest pressure to be able to test your treatments. Vern, you're thinking like an entomologist and, and yes, it absolutely is. And that's something we've toyed with. But um, one of the things that we enjoy doing most is, is doing our research in partner with commercial growers. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, it's tricky, right? You want, you want to have as, as much damage if you're a researcher, but you don't want any damage if you're a grower. Um, I'd see there's another question that, that just came in about um, when to apply beneficial nematodes. Um, and I don't know if it, oh, it's when in the season. Um, so I, th I think Elson would be able to speak a little bit more about the timing for his native. Those are, those are persistent, right? So if you, if you apply those native nematodes, um, they're going to persist in the soil for many years far going forward. And so that probably doesn't matter. Um, but if you're doing, you know, if you're growing carrots and you want to put a, one of the biopesticide versions of the, the nematodes in that are not necessarily going to survive the winter, you're going to want to do that, you know, earlier in the season so that you actually get your money's worth. And you mentioned Elson, that's Elson Shields. Yes. Cornell, he's got a research program in upstate New York and has been working on essentially encouraging native um, native controls for uh, wireworms and other root. root yeah, pests. he you inoculate the soil with nematodes and then they they stay for for you know essentially going forward and and I believe that the Arnolds have had some success um, with inoculating their fields with with Elson's nematodes um, but don't quote me on that. I don't know if any of the Arnolds are on this right now. They might be so they can put something in the chat. Well, thank you, Scott, Scott and Vic, for all the great work you do with growers. And um, <clears throat> Virginia just posted, uh, Virginia, our VVBGA secretary, the members got a notification that the annual report is posted on the VVBGA website. It includes um, a summary of Scott and Vic's work on weekly pest scouting, insect pest scouting over the season that's been funded by the VVBGA. And I know people appreciate getting those reports. And up oh, here's a comment from Paul and Sandy saying they had great success with two applications of nematodes. So something to keep an eye out in the future of when that might be more widely available to growers.